Good morning. So how are y'all? You're freaked out a little bit? A little messed up? Uh, somebody said, where do I sit? And she's a front row, and I said, you got eight front rows to kind of choose from. Um, this, this is actually my fault. Uh, this was my suggestion. Uh, let me tell you why. Uh, we're in this 21-day fast thing, and, and um, I just think that it's cool to know that we're, we're on this journey together. Uh, that's probably what separates this church maybe from others that look and sound a little bit like us, is that it's really important to us is that we learn how to do life together. And um, so we're on this journey together, so I thought at least for a couple of weeks, because I know that y'all love me, right? <laughs> Please, you love me. And you'll put up with anything for a couple of weeks, right? <clears throat> so I thought that we would just kind of do this so that we'll understand that you have the opportunity not just to look at me, but to create this intimate setting where you can look around and see each other and know that, you know what, you're not alone. Uh, we're all on this journey together. I'm very, very thankful. I have an incredible staff, more so than you could ever possibly imagine. Went into a, a meeting a few weeks ago, and I said, hey, this, what if we were to, you know, do this thing in the round and build this stage? And, uh, and they're absolutely amazing. Uh, Dylan, that, uh, that leads his team, Will, that leads his team, uh, and Greg, uh, who is our facilities guy. Greg is probably the most, we say this all the time, he very well may be the most creative person in this church phenomenal. And they, they put a lot of hours into this. I mean, a lot more than you think. There's a lot more to it than just bringing out some stages and setting something up. Um, and these guys were willing to do that. They didn't fuss or gripe or complain at all to me, at least to my face. <laughs> I know them because they didn't do it behind uh, closed doors either. They're, they're, they're amazing. And I have, you just should know, I don't take that for granted. Um, the, the beauty of, of, of staff relationships, and that we love each other, that doing life together is what it's all about. Uh, that goes far beyond just showing up on a, on a Sunday morning and doing church, but it's what, you, what we do and how we live our lives together behind the scenes. And that's what makes this place as sweet as it is. It's, it is those relationships, and I think the overflow of that, that just happens. So would you just help me give them a huge round of applause just to say thank you? <clears throat> so we're in this series called A Less Is More, and we're talking about fasting. Get it? <laughs> I'm so funny. Less is more, and we're talking about fasting. So if you're new to Springwell, maybe new to church, and you're really not sure what the whole fasting thing is about, it's simply put, fasting is this. It's giving up something for the sake of a spiritual purpose. It's giving up something for the sake of... Of the, of the spiritual purpose. Now, last week, we started a 21-day fast. So aren't you glad if you're new, you just showed up this week, right? You've already had seven days of, of freedom or whatever that might be. But here it is. Here's our spiritual purpose for the next 21 days. Our spiritual, our spiritual purpose is this, is that we want to we spend less time somewhere so that we can open up more time to spend with Jesus. It's just that simple. It's not hard. It's not complicated. That is our spiritual purpose. For example, some of you may have decided, you know what, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give up lunch every day. I'm going to give up lunch every day for the next 21 days. And what I'm going to do during my lunch hour is, you know, rather than fight the crowds, try to make it to a burger joint or whatever the case might be, I'm going to take the devotional material that's been provided for us and I'm just going to maybe go to my car I'm going to find somewhere in the office to kind of be alone, and I'm just going to work through, and I'm going, to, I'm going to get in the Word a little bit. I'm going to pray. I'm kind of going to just seek God. You know, I'm going to spend some time with Him. In other words, I'm just going to, I'm going to spend less time here eating, and I'm going to spend more time with Jesus. For some of you, it might be TV at night, and you might want to come home and say, you know what, I mean, I've probably watched way too much TV anyway, and, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an hour or maybe two hours that I normally spend watching TV, and I'm going to spend less time on, on TV, and I'm going to spend more time on Jesus. That makes sense? Get it? Less is more. That's our goal. And as, uh, as we started this fast last week, there's three things I ask you to pray for. You, obviously, as you're praying, praying for whatever God leads you. Some of you are praying for a job, keep praying for that job. I'm not telling you not to pray for that. You know, some of you are praying for your mother-in-law. I don't know why, but you do that, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. My mother-in-law's not here today, so I can say that, I guess. I want you to spend, whatever you pray, pray about, I want you to spend time in three particular areas. Number one, I want you to pray for yourself, which sounds a little selfish. 
it, it kind of sounds like, what, really? I mean, you want me to pray for me? It sounds like that I have that it's all about me kind of mentality. Well, hang on, because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The second thing that I want you to do is I want you to pray for others. I, I'm, for me, I'm praying for my wife. I'm praying for Karen. I'm praying for Emily, and I'm praying for Katie. I'm praying very specific prayers. What I'm praying is not just that they'll go through the 21-day fast and God will bless them. That's not the prayer. The prayer is that they will have this this experience with Jesus, that as they're spending time less over here and more time over here with him, is that God will show up in an amazing way. And what they will have is a Jesus experience. I'm not praying that they'll get more religious. I'm not praying like that they'll show up at church more. I'm praying what they'll have is a God encounter. And then the third thing, I'm just asking that you join the rest of us as we're praying with all the other things that you might pray for, is that you would just pray for a burden for what's broken. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we were in Nehemiah chapter 1, and we just saw how this guy had this burden. It had to be a God-given burden for the walls of Jerusalem, a, probably a place he's never seen. That he would be burdened over a place that he's probably never been for a group of people that he probably didn't even know in an intimate way. And so what we've been praying is that God would just give us a burden as we look around. And it might be a big burden. I mean, some of you may walk away and say, I have a, I have a burden to feed the people in Africa. Great. And maybe we can partner with you and make those kind of things happen. But you know what? We're just praying that maybe God will just burden you, maybe for your neighbor. Maybe somebody that you've been living beside for a very long time, but you know what? You've never really engaged in a conversation. And maybe you've never really served that person. You've just kind of spoke, but what if in the next few weeks, God would begin to just stir your heart that you begin to pray for your neighbor and care about your neighbor? Well, what if it's the guy at work? You know, the guy that comes in that nobody really pays any attention to? The guy that mostly eats lunch alone? Maybe it's that girl at school that nobody really hangs out with. That girl that just kind of wanders down the halls aimlessly all by herself with, with no real purpose and doesn't seem like she has any friends. What if God would begin to burden you for just maybe that one person? And so that's what I'm asking that you pray for, that you pray for yourself, that you pray for others, and that you pray for a burden for what's broken. This morning, I want us to focus on really what it means when I ask you to pray for yourself. Maybe C.S. Lewis said it best. In his book, Mere Christianity, when he said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, did you get the first part? If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, C.S. Lewis says the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And see, I think that part of the human condition is that we have a thirst that the world can't satisfy. And, and some of us know what that's like, and so we've tried to find something else that will kind of quench this thirst that we have, right? And they're not necessarily bad things. It might be that you have money, and money can be good. Can all the money people said, yeah, there you go. I'm not against money, are you? And if you are, give me yours. I'd love to have it. I mean, I just you know, take that burden away from you. Fame. Some people, you know, maybe they thought that if I could just be popular enough, if I could be famous enough, then maybe that would quench the thirst. But you know what? It never did. So maybe it's relationship. Maybe it's possessions. Maybe it's sex. <laughs> that woke you up, didn't it? What? He said sex. It's, God created it. And God is good. Are y'all nervous? I'm actually going to preach on sex in a few weeks. You don't want to miss it. Yay, God. I'm just saying. <laughs> Only here. You're not going to get this anywhere else. And it's not that these things in their proper place are bad. They just don't quench that thirst. Even relationships, right? Just don't quite quench that thirst. And I don't think you have to be a Christian to understand that. In fact, that's exactly why some of you are here this morning at this crazy place on a Sunday morning. You're not a follower of Jesus, but you know what? You've just felt like that in, for some time it, now, in your life, something has been missing. And you've, this would be, this, so this fast would be really good for you. 
You say, well, I don't even, I'm not a part of your church. I mean, I'm not a Christian. Great. Then what would it be like if you just spent some time in the next 14 days, what if you just spent some time hanging out with Jesus, investigating the claims of Christ to see whether or not there might be something to this Jesus stuff? I'm just saying. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul, O Lord, pants for you. So we were created with this thirst, this deep desire, not for religion, not for religion, this deep desire to have this intimate, sweet, personal relationship with Jesus. That, that actually cannot be quenched by just showing up at church every now and again on a Sunday morning. No, 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 no. This is something that goes deeper than that. God wants a relationship with us. It's crazy that the God, the creator of the universe, would desire to have a relationship with people like us. But he does. And I think if we're honest, most of us would say, you know what, I hear that, the thing of it is, I'm just not sure that God is the thing. I'm not sure that God's the thing, so we just kind of keep looking somewhere else for this quench to be, this thirst to be quenched. Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody and uh, you wanted it to go a lot further than they did? Any, anybody? Go ahead, it's okay. Like you know, We all think we're losers if we raise our hand. Get your hand up. Thank you. We're not, I'm not the only one. That's right, you know. You know what that's like? And it's not necessarily that they were mean or they were ugly. It, it's not that they were hateful to you. It's just that the, the more that you tried to push that relationship to go deeper, they just kind of was like, nah, I'm not really interested in this kind of relationship with you at all. And if you haven't been in that kind of relationship, to hang on, probably you will at some point. Here's what's crazy for me. Here's why I love the Bible. I love the Bible because in the Bible, God is presented as a heavenly father who desires with all of his heart to have this deep, personal, sweet, intimate relationship with us. In fact, in, in Luke's gospel, uh, God's presented as a father who wants this deep, sweet relationship with his son. And his son decides that, you know what, dad, it ain't cool being home. I've talked to some of my friends. It looks like what my friends are telling me about is a lot better than what you've been telling me about. And so this son, in spite of all of his father's loving and all of his father's trying to keep him at home, his father chooses another culture, another way of life other than his father. And so I love this chapter because it says, like in verse 17 of Luke 15, it says, and then when he came to himself, he realized how many hired fathers of my, uh, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and yet I perish with hunger. And so finally he comes to this place and he says, you know what? The very thing that I didn't think would satisfy is the very thing that I've been looking for this whole time. And you know what he says? He says, I it, would be, it would be sweet to go back home and say, Dad, I'm your son, and I'm home, but I'm not worthy anymore, because, I mean, I blew it. And so he says, I'll just go back home, and I'll say, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll just come back as a hired servant. And so his father, here's the beautiful picture of Luke 15, and is there is this father, and he's waiting, he's looking down the road, and he sees his son coming. And then he runs to his son to beat the living daylights out of him. <laughs> no, that's not it. He sees his son a great distance off and he runs and he falls on him and he kisses him and he puts a new robe on him and he puts new sandals on his feet and he puts rings on his fingers and he says, this my son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost and now he's been found. And that's how the Bible presents God as he desires a relationship with us. It's pretty sweet. The Bible's really clear that God desires a relationship with us. Listen, that's not casual or distant or respectful or polite, but that is intimate and personal. 
I somehow grew up to think that God was mostly into respectful, polite, and quiet. How many of you were raised in a church if you were in church and you said you can't run in church? You, this, this used to be a jam. So people would come into this building before we put the carpet down, and, you know, like there's, there's uh, it's marked off for basketball. And parents would say, don't you run in here. And the child looks down and goes, it's a basketball court. I was brought up in that church that when you're in church, you were supposed to be quiet. And so what I learned somehow was that what God wanted from me was for me to be quiet, respectful, and polite. Suddenly you get into Scripture and you find out that's not what he's been after at all. So really what I want us to do this morning, I want us to go to the book of Revelation and kind of unpack this thought. Can you believe that? The book of Revelation. <laughs> Aren't you excited? The book of... Now, if, if you were brought up in church, it's the book of Revelation. <laughs> and I just feel like I'm really spiritual when I say it that way. So we're going to be in the book of Revelation. Now, for those of you that are brand new to church or you hadn't been in church for a very long time, and that's about 50% of you, um, the book of Revelation is an interesting book. It can, let's just be honest, it can be a scary book. Hello? Have you, have you ever read the, the Mark of the Beast and Four-Headed This? And, uh, you know, I just, it's, it can be nasty. So, you like, you don't want to read this as like your devotional material before you go to bed at night. I mean, it would just be really, really bad. You don't want to do that. And people have certainly misinterpreted, honestly, they've misinterpreted the book they didn't really know why it was written. And I've known, especially years ago, not so much in, la in, in the last few years, but there was a time when, when people wrote books on the, uh, the book of Revelation that were really just an attempt to scare people to Jesus. Die, scare, you, scare the hell out of you is what they were trying to do. You, can you say that? I could say that at 9 o'clock. I'm not sure I could get away with it at 11. But anyway, are you with me? And so they were scared to death. And so people made tons of money saying that this book was written for this purpose. And it was not written for that purpose at all. This, this book was written to a group of people who were being persecuted, people that were dying. This was a book that was written to give encouragement. It wasn't written to be a book that would scare you. It was written by a guy named John. Now, old John, you've heard about John before, right? The Gospel of John, right? First, second, third John, same John. This is a guy who had an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. This was the guy that was at the foot of the cross when, as Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was dying, that he looked down and he said, Mama... John's going to take care of you, because I love John. This was the same guy that walked with Jesus when he was on planet Earth, that saw him heal sick people and lame people and raise the dead. I mean, this was a guy, if anybody knew the purpose and the mission of Jesus, it had to be, it had to be John. And at the beginning of this book, that um, he really is more of just taking dictation. That's what he's doing. He's listening to the Holy Spirit, and he says, this is what I want you to write now. And in the beginning of this book, he starts off writing some short little letters that are directed at seven legit churches. Now, I say that because, again, people get into the book of Revelation and they say, well, there's so much symbolism. How can you possibly know? This is really, really easy. These are real churches in real cities, actual cities in Asia Minor. And the letter that we're going to, this little letter that we're going to look at this morning was written to the church at Laodicea. And I think this is really important, just to give you a little more background. You love it when I give you background, don't you? Say, yes, yes, we love it, we love it. Thank you. Another little piece of information that, that I think will help you understand is this, is it was written, these words were written and intended for Christian people. In a Christian church, and they reflect the fact, this is really important, they reflect the, the fact that you can be super religious, you can be very respectful of God and not have a relationship with Jesus at all. Now, honestly, there's some commentators out there that say that this is not a legit church, that these people weren't Christians, and they struggle with certain areas of it, and they don't know how to reconcile how these people are and what, and what the, uh, uh, God says about this church. They don't know how to reconcile all that, so sometimes they just say, well, I just don't think they were saved at all. Be honest with you, I'm not sure, but here's what I do know. There's something that we can learn from these folks. I know that. So let's dig in. Revelation chapter 3. This is going to be so much fun. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right. So here's the thing. You're not going to understand anything that I tell you from here on out unless you understand a little bit about this city 
called Laodicea. For example, crucial to this city was its water supply. Now, they had some local streams. But as the population grew, the streams, these local streams, were just, they were just not enough. And I even read that in the wintertime, some of these streams would dry up altogether. But these people were really, really super smart. And because they were so smart, they managed to build an aqueduct, and the water flowed down through this aqueduct to the Sea of Laodicea, which the good news is that they had water, right? Yay for them. They had water. Bad news, it was really dirty, bad water. So they had water, it was just full of impurities, which made it dirty and nasty. I also read that this was a, an area from a commercial standpoint that rocked. It was um, the banking hub, because it was on the crossroads for people moving in all different directions, a place for them to be able to, to locate their funds. And I read, I read that they became so wealthy that in 60 AD, when literally an earthquake can completely leveled the place, and Rome said, you know what? You guys are really smart. You're really sharp people. We want to walk with you, so we're going we're gonna to give you some money to help you rebuild. You know what they said? We don't need your stinking money. That's what they said. No kidding. You should read it. It's in history. So said, we don't need your money because we're so smart and we're so wealthy, we can rebuild this city all by ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, history records that with their own money, from no help with Rome at all, that the city was more beautiful, more luxurious than it had ever been. So they were extremely wealthy. They were also known, they were also famous and well-known for their wool industry. It was some type of black, shiny wool, that's all I know. It was also um, known for a medical school that was about 13 miles north of the city, and they developed this, this eye salve. I'm not sure what kind of eye salve it was, but people came from all over their, that part of the world to, this, to get this miracle eye salve. So they were wealthy, and it was a pretty happening little city. Now let's read on. There are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true witness, and the ruler of God's creation. I know, I know your deeds. So... They sound pretty good so far, right? So he says, you know what? You people are really, really sharp. I mean, this is a city that's, that's thriving financially. They've got money. They've got everything that you can think of. And he said, I even know that you have some deeds. Now, we don't know if they were good or bad. They just know that they had some, that they had some deeds. Then he says, I know your deeds that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one of the other." Here's another little piece of information that you, have to, that you need to know if you're ever going to be able to interpret this passage correctly. And that is this. Roman aqueducts received hot water from the north, from the city of Aeropolis, and they were famous for this soothing, hot, healing springs. Can't you just feel that right now? The old tired body, and you just got to get down in that, that hot tub. Yeah, it's kind of sweet. They were also known from the south from having this refreshing cold water from Colossa. So here's what he's saying, because this has kind of been misinterpreted over the years. Here's what he's saying. He says, you know what? I just wish that you were either hot or cold. I know that you got some deeds, but the thing of it is, you're not like refreshing cold water, nor do you have this, this hot uh, water coming from, from, the, uh, from the south. You don't have that. I mean, I wish you were one or the other, because if you were hot, it would be like for medicinal purposes. People could get down in and enjoy that hot water. I wish that you were like cold and refreshing water from Colossa, but you're neither. So then well, here's what he says. And so because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, understanding their water, now you know what he means, right? He says, so here's the thing. When I taste of you, it's as nauseating to me as it is for you when you taste that nasty water that you've been trying to drink. And I just want to spit you out of my mouth. And then he says this, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. Remember? Remember in 60 AD? Remember when there was that earthquake? Remember when they rebuilt the city all on their own and Rome tried to give them some money and said, we don't need your stinking money. We can do this on our own. We are wealthy. We are independent. We don't need you. 
But you do not realize that you are, in effect, you are wretched and you are pitiful and you are poor. And they would have said, poor? Who are you calling poor? We're not poor, we're rich. We got the IVSAP thing going on. Yeah, he said, you're blind and you're naked. No, 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 we're not naked. We've got that wool thing, that, that shiny black wool. We're not naked. We've got the finest of clothes. We've got the ISAF. And he said, no, you're not. You're wretched and you're blind and you're poor. Because what you don't have is an intimate relationship with me. You're religious. You got some deeds. But really, compared to how rich you are, the little bit that you're doing, what is really that worth? Then he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. And he's saying, you know what? I have been what you've been looking for your whole life. And I wrote this because I think it was really, really critical for me. I'm not just what you need, I'm what you want. Y'all know the difference between those two? I mean, like, let's say, for example, how many of you last Christmas got underwear for Christmas? Did you anybody? Did you get drawers? Anybody get drawers? Can we just be honest? When you open that up, I mean, we're like, you stoked over drawers. I mean, your wife looked at you and said, honey, you need some new underwear. And you may have looked at your wife and said, you know what, honey, you're exactly right. I know I need them, but that ain't what I wanted. What we, see, sometimes what we think we need and what we want we think is different. Here's what I love. What Jesus does is he meets both of those needs for me. He is what I need. I need salvation. I cannot obtain that on my own. And then he gives me what I want, and that is love. This incredible relationship that I know I don't deserve. It's so sweet. And then he drops down to verse 20, and if you've been in church, you've heard this verse. And if you haven't been in church, it might be kind of new to you, but there's a sweet, sweet concept in this verse. And it's verse 20. Here's what it says. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. God, the creator of the universe, this is the same guy. He, he's the guy that in the beginning, he spoke and it was. He took some dust and... and and he made Adam, and then he took a rib out of Adam, and he made Eve. Wow. That same God says, here I am, and I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. In other words, here's what he's saying. I know that you've got some deeds. I know that you're religious. I know you've done some things. But religious activity is not what I'm looking for. Religious activity is not it. That's not why you were created and put on planet Earth. I don't need you to accomplish my purpose. I want you. And I just want to be in a relationship with you. God's saying, you know what, in spite of all my power and all my ability, there's one thing I cannot do. Now, there's a lot of things that he can do. He can speak to you in the middle of the night, like, you know, with a, a voice of thunder, scare the snot out of you. You know what I'm talking about? If God spoke to you in the middle of the night and said, hey, I mean, you pre I'm pretty sure you'd get up and say, what? You know, like, what do you want me to do? I'm ready. I'm ready. He said, well, you, you can wait till in the morning. You're probably thinking, no, let's just do it now. I mean, what do, you, what do you want? God could put fear in us, and that fear could drive us to serve him. God said, I'm all powerful. I could make that happen. And as, but as powerful as I am, the thing that I cannot do is make you love me. And all I've ever wanted was for you to love me. It's crazy. And that's the picture of God that we have. All powerful God standing outside of a door, gently knocking wanting to come in and to be with us. Well, maybe now you'll understand why the first challenge for Christ followers is for us to pray and to fast for yourself. That maybe we would give up an hour every night. <laughs> what would that be, really? 
an hour every night just to hang out with God who desires a relationship with us. And you say, but you don't understand what I've done. And he doesn't care what you've done. That was the point of Jesus going to the cross. That was the point of the cross. Jesus said, I'm going to provide a way for us to be in the most intimate of all relationships. It's not because you deserve it. It's because I want it. And it's not to use you. It's not just so that you'll serve and that you'll do. I can do anything. I'm God. It's because that's what I want. So if you're here this morning, you know what? Maybe this is your first Sunday and you're thinking, oh, gee, I missed out. No, you haven't. You can, like, jump right in. And there's booklets that are available. We'll help you with all of that to, to jump into this 21-day fast just so that what you can be about the business of doing right now is building that intimate relationship with Jesus. Because he's not impressed with your religious activity. He's not impressed with what you do. He just wants you. So maybe you're here this morning and you aren't a follower of Jesus and you're wondering, so how does this apply to me? Like, I showed up on the wrong Sunday? No. Nah. So you can, like, jump right in with this fast. Like, so what if, what if, you're not even a follower of Jesus, but what if, for the next 14 days, what if you decided, I'm just going to, like, give God this hour, this 30 minutes. I'm going to give him 30 minutes, and I'm going to say, God, you know what? I'm thirsty. I know that I am. That stupid preacher, you know, he's kind of crazy, but he said that this thirst that I have is a thirst that comes from you. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to give you some time, and I'm going to investigate, and I'm going to find out if this is it. What if you did that? There's a couple of books I would highly recommend. You can come talk to me after the service, and I'll tell you about those books. Why don't you join us? There's some of you that are here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus and you know what? You just had the wrong information. You just didn't know that what God wanted was this close, intimate, personal, sweet relationship. He's not, he doesn't want your religious activity. It's not what he's interested in. He's interested in you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I didn't know that. And if I'd known that, I'd have given my life to Jesus a long time ago. So every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus, and you'd like to be. Then quietly, right there in your seat, maybe you'd just pray a prayer or something like this. Maybe you'd say, Father, I know that I have miserably failed you. And I know that I do fail you every day of my life. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And this morning, I have just heard the most incredible news that you love me. And that what you want from me is a relationship. So Jesus, I'm asking you right now just to forgive me of my sin. Forgive me. I need you. But I want you. Thank you for your love. Forgive me of my sin. I surrender my life to you. Everybody look this way. Sometimes we come to the end of a service like this and, and we hurry to get out, you know, whatever there is out there. Sometimes I think we miss, sometimes the sweetest part of the service is that part at the end, you know, when you just maybe kind of surrendered. So here's what we're going to do. The band's just going to play beautiful, incredible song. And then can we just like hang out for just a minute and just reflect? And you may, if you want to come kneel here around the stage, you can, if that's what you'd like to do. You can kneel right there at your seat. There's nothing magical about this stage. Maybe you just want to sit there in your seat and just reflect and listen and worship.